Thank you. Hola. Bon dia. Good morning. I promise I won't try to do any more in Portuguese. Uh, welcome to JSConf Brazil, and thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Dave Furfro, and I'd like to talk to you about a personal art project that I've been working on recently. Whoa. Hold on. There we go. The project is entitled Close Enough, wherein I deconstruct the creative process of a famous contemporary artist, Chuck Close, and attempt to recreate his style using JavaScript and other technologies. Okay, some of these quotes may be difficult for uh, the language. Uh, but this talk may be a little different than most of the other talks here today except the one right before it, which is also the pursuit of a passion project. But if you bear with me a few minutes, I'd like to talk to you a little about Chuck Close, the artist behind the project. And I promise we will get to code. Chuck Close is a very accomplished American artist who has had a very successful career. He is a painter, a printmaker, a photographer. He's associated with the photorealism school, the pop art school, and the abstract expressionism school. He holds two fine arts degrees from Yale University. He has received some of the art world's most prestigious honors. He has held over 200 solo exhibitions worldwide. And most importantly, his paintings sell for millions of dollars a piece. Chuck Close is most famously known for his distinctive style of portraiture. Throughout his career, he's almost exclusively painted portraits that he refers to as heads. His subjects are usually friends and colleagues, including those shown here, the artist Richard Serra, the composer Philip Glass, and fellow painter Alex Katz. Close has even admitted to using his art as an excuse to meet people who he admires. Included among those, are the presidents Clinton and Obama, who invited him to paint their presidential portraits. But there's no doubt that throughout his career, his favorite subject has always been himself. Whenever exploring a new style or technique, Close often starts with a self-portrait, and he has explored many styles. Throughout his career, he has mastered varied drawing and painting techniques, uh, such as ink, pastel, watercolor, even finger painting. Printmaking techniques such as etching, woodcuts, and silkscreen. Even handmade paper collage, daguerreotypes, and jacquard tapestries. But before we deconstruct his work, I'd like to talk just a little bit about Close and deconstruct the man behind the heads. When standing in front of one of Close's enormous portraits, and admiring its accuracy and level of craftsmanship, it's hard to imagine the process behind its construction and even harder, the circumstances that shaped his process. In his lifetime, Close faced much adversity. He suffers from dyslexia, which is a reading disorder that causes difficulty learning despite normal intelligence. To this day, Close cannot add or subtract in his head and he can't even, uh, he never learned multiplication. He also suffers from something called prosopagnosia, which is called face blindness, and has trouble remembering faces and names. He said that painting these large portraits has helped him to remember the people that he meets. As a result of his adversities, he struggled in school, both academically and athletically, and was always called dumb or lazy. But he often used his artwork and gave it to his teachers to demonstrate his comprehension of the material to earn extra credit and compensate for his poor grades. He learned at an early age that in order to solve complex problems, he needed to break them down into smaller ones. This is not unlike the way we as developers approach problems. I'd like to examine the process Close uses to create one of his heads. He always starts first with a photograph of his subject. The photograph is always closely cropped 
and uses a short focal length to remove any unnecessary detail from the background. He enlarges the photograph and using a pen and ruler draws a grid over it. The photograph becomes what Close calls a maquette, which is a small model or what we developers might call a prototype. As you can see in the photo, there are small lines drawn across, each one of which he will study closely and reproduce on canvas. Close then works very methodically, transferring the image represented in his grid, starting from the top left hand corner of his canvas and continuing down to the lower right. This is a pattern that he has used from day one to the present. Here is one of Close's earliest self-portraits, and we can see not only the level of realism that he applies, but also the size. Many of his heads are about nine feet tall, or three meters to anyone outside of the United States. At the age of 49, Close was at the height of his career when he suffered a sudden rupture of a spinal artery. The incident, which he refers to as the event, required intensive care and physical therapy and left him a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the waist down. But no stranger to adversity, Close was committed to returning to his work. And while still in the hospital, his wife and doctors set up a small studio for him to paint. Eight months later, he was painting again using a brush held between his teeth. The first painting Close completed after the event was a portrait of his good friend and fellow artist, Alex Katz. You might recognize the photo from earlier. Close often takes the fo one photograph and then uses it time and time again in different styles. The event left an indelible impression on Close, one that severely impacted the way he worked, but also his determination. Oh, sorry, <laughs> but not his determination. In the following years, his style would become decidedly more expressive, relying less on technical precision and more on shapes, patterns, and color. Now why am I here to talk about it? <laughs> uh, my name is Dave Furfro, and I'm an active member of the JavaScript and improv communities in New York. I was also an art school student in the 90s, and in 1993, I dropped out of art school after two professors told me that I lacked the discipline to become an artist. I found that to be a bit ironic which, because lack of discipline is why I became an artist. More specifically, I got in trouble for using a computer to complete a class assignment. That assignment was to draw several parallel straight lines by hand. This was a different time. This was 1991 and the desktop publishing movement was very limited uh, to Madison Avenue in New York in the advertising industry. Not many people were using computers uh, just to create art. I chose to let the computer do the work for me because it could do it better and faster. And since then, it's all history. Today I work as a technology, at a technology and design agency called Huge in Brooklyn. We also have an office in Rio and we are hiring front end developers. Take a look at our website, hugeinc.com, in case you're in the back. Uh, online, I can be found at FERF, just about everywhere you look. This one's a little dark. That's me. I got the idea for this project during some downtime at the office. I had recently been working on a project to build a user interface that required me to blur video in real time in the browser. I tried to create the effect using CSS filters, but it didn't come out quite right. CSS filters leave feathering around the edges of the container, uh, and the filters lack the support that we needed to provide. So one day while taking a nap inside my canvas tote bag, I had an epiphany. Why not try blurring the video myself? And it turns out that the tool I was looking for was already existent in the browser. HTML's canvas element provided all the things we needed. 
It provided a rich API, including methods for drawing vector shapes, importing images, and manipulating data, and it's really good at it. It's very fast. After a couple hours and a couple of tweaks, I had video blurring at 60 frames per second across the browser matrix. And more importantly, I'd become stoked about the possibilities of making art with pure data, and it was only a matter of time before I would find the urge to make art with my computer once again. For those of you who haven't seen it before, the canvas element is a very simple element. It has only two special parameters, a width and a height, but its DOM API extends from HTML element and it can be fully styled using CSS classes and properties. Like other elements, canvases can be created directly in JavaScript using create element. But by itself, the canvas element is a pretty useless element. Although, in this case, I think it makes a rather nice minimalist statement in the gallery. And I've seen art sell that looks worse than this sell for more. <laughs> but inside the canvas is its secret sauce, the canvas rendering context. The rendering context provides the rich API for drawing and manipulating images that makes Canvas such a powerful creative tool. Taking my lead from Close, whose disabilities required that he break down problems into smaller ones, I decided to take the same approach. In fact, breaking down a problem into logical, uh, executable steps should be a pattern familiar to all of us. Before we can architect big systems, we must first understand and build the smaller components. And the first component I explored was color. In Close's work, he layers vibrant strokes of varying color that, in the distance, combine to form the familiar neutral tones and skin tones of his subjects. I theorized that I could simulate the layering of these colors by selecting two colors of similar proximity to the original color and then layering them in equal area. I decided to test my theory by painting a square and then layering on top of it a circle with an area equal to half of that square. According to Close, his first color choice is always arbitrary. And fortunately for us in JavaScript, arbitrary is very easy. But first, I needed a color to simulate. Here you can see I chose a flesh tone from a self-portrait because this is the kind of color I would need to reproduce very often. Next, we need to choose a random color and its equidistant opposite. So what do I mean by that? RGB is a 3D color space where each color can be plotted by its red, green, and blue component values. And the cube itself can be drawn by plotting integers from its origin of zero to its extents of 255 on each of its three axes. Every color you see on your screen and every color you write in your CSS exists in this cube. Once we know how to find our origin color inside of this cube, we can pick a color at random and then find its opposite on the other side of the original color. But our random can't be completely random. If we chose a random color that was quite distant from the original color, then its complement may possibly lie outside of our cube, and combining the two would bring back an image that wasn't the one we were looking for. So first, to ensure that both colors will exist within the cube, we have to limit the range of our random value using the lesser of the distance from our origin's component values to the cube's bounds at 0 and 255. Once we have our safe range, we can easily select a random integer within that distance in either direction, either positive or negative. And voila, we have a random neighbor and an opposite neighbor. Simply by adding the random to the component RGB values on one and subtracting them from the other. If you were to draw a line from, these from one of these colors to the other, it would run straight through the origin color at its halfway point. In fact, the distance from each of our neighbors to the origin color can be measured using Euclid's formula for calculating distance in a three-dimensional space. The square root of a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the Pythagorean theorem. The square root of a squared plus b squared plus c squared. 
So now that we have our colors, we can start drawing our shapes. Uh, context fill rec is used to draw rectangles on a canvas. It takes four arguments, x and y coordinates, and width and height. Fill rec only defines the path. We still need to add a fill style property and call the fill method before we can paint the rectangle onto our canvas. Here we can see our random and opposite colors. We've known since grade school that red and yellow make orange, but let's make sure. Next, we'll need to calculate the size of our circle. First, we just have the area of our rectangle and then use the inverse of the calculation of a circle's area, which is the square root of the area divided by pi. We'll use context arc to draw our circle. Arc takes four arguments, x and y, which are its midpoint, a radius, a start and end angle, and an optional argument, direction, which is clockwise if it's true. The angles are measured in radians with math pi times two equaling 360 or a full circle. So did we succeed? Those of you in the back of the room or those of you with poorer vision probably have an easier time telling. For the rest of us, we can squint our eyes and perhaps we can see or we can write a function that will tell us definitively. First, we need to be able to read canvas data from these canvases. And for those of you uh, who can't read the code right now, you'll have to trust me. These are actually dynamically drawn right now. They're not images. <laughs> Context's get image data method returns an object which contains the underlying pixel data for the area of the canvas specified by its arguments, x, y, width, and height. It doesn't get you right to the data. You need to get the data's data, which is pretty meta and appropriate for the art world. And this is what that data looks like. It's a one-dimensional array of 8-bit unsigned integers that represent the component values of the colors in RGBA. Maybe that will help you understand. Each quartet of members, each red, green, blue, and in this case gray, which represents opacity or alpha channel, equals one pixel. So now that we know that, here's how we can iterate the colors of our canvas. We iterate by stepping four values at a time, or one pixel, and collecting the components for each color. And if we can do that, it's very easy to calculate the average color of a given rectangle by summing its component values and dividing by the number of pixels, which is the length of the data array divided by four. So let's see how we did. I'd say that's pretty close. I'd say my theory was confirmed, and all I needed to do from here was transfer what I learned about color to portraiture. In the spirit of Mr. Close, I'll use my, myself as a guinea pig for my experiments. And thanks to Instagram, Instagram, I already have this attractive, closely cropped, short focus selfie at my disposal. And thanks to context draw image method, we have an easy way to import images into our canvas. Simply create a new image assign an onload handler, and load the image. When the image loads, resize the canvas to the image's natural width and height. The natural dimensions reflect the actual pixels in the image, and it's preferred that you use these dimensions as opposed to width and height, because if you were to pull your image from the DOM instead, they may, these numbers may be skewed due to CSS styling. Like I said, you have to trust me. While it may not be completely obvious, the canvas on the right has, been, has completely loaded its data from the image on the left. So now that we have the ability to draw an image on a canvas, we have the ability to iterate the image data of a canvas, and we have the ability to average color of a section of that image data, we can now create our own maquette, our prototype, our grid for drawing our portraits. On this canvas, 
we've imported the image using draw image, then used get image, uh, using get image, we've pulled the image data one tile at a time, iterated that data with an average function, and used fill rect to replace the original data with the rectangle of our average color. But it turns out that all that math is not optimal for performance. Fortunately, there's a trick for that. One that I learned when optimizing video blur to achieve 60 frames a second. We don't need to calculate the average of each square. We can draw the image into a proportionally smaller canvas and then draw the smaller canvas back into the larger canvas, allowing the native uh, browser to do the work. And voila. Ugh. Okay. That's, that's not quite right. It's a bit blurry. But wait. Context has a property for that. <laughs> By disabling image smoothing, we have our optimized way to draw our mosaic. It's orders of magnitude faster than calculating averages on large portraits. So now we know how to draw a mosaic, and we've already learned how to define random colors and apply them in equal proportion. So we're ready for our first real head. Not bad for the first attempt. From afar, you can recognize the image as my Instagram selfie. And up close, we can see that the image is actually composed of colored squares and circles of varying color. But I found that my approach gave me colors that were too repetitive and unsatisfactory. But fortunately, after doing some research, there's a better approach to color. It's called the lab color space. And anyone who's worked with Photoshop and set a color in the color dialog maybe has seen it but had no idea what it is. Rather than red, green, and blue, lab defines color as lightness and then two arbitrary points on a coordinate, A and B. It's another three-dimensional color space for describing color but it was designed to, exp to approximate human perception of the color spectrum. The distance between colors in the lab color space relate to a specific human perceptible shift in color. The same distance in one direction from a given color will be perceived as the same shift in the going in the other direction of that color. This color space was much better suited to finding random and opposite colors, at least using my simple algorithm. Kind of hard to tell a little bit on, on the projection here. Uh, perception of color is highly subjective and can be affected by the medium by which you view it. Uh, but I personally prefer the variety of colors that moving into the lab color space provided. It was a broader part of the spectrum. So now that I was sufficiently happy with my color formula, it was time to add more dots. Since our first two colors combined nicely to form one, I looked for a pattern to add more. Simply adding another random and opposite pair was not satisfactory, as I often got similar random colors for colors that existed closer to the bounds of the color space. As I described before, I could only move as far away from a color as I could provide room for two colors. So I theorized that instead, if I remove the top color, and split it into another pair of random and opposite colors and return those two colors with an equal area that the three colors would convert back to the original color. Turns out this is a very repeatable pattern. It looks something like this. With each iteration of the loop, we can pop the last color off of the array, create two new colors, and then push them back onto the stack. Every time you do this, you're only taking off the one and returning two. So with each iteration, you're adding a new color to your palette. So now that I was happy with my color algorithm, it was time to explore some shapes. Some of my favorite heads are the ones which close rotates his grid 45 degrees, creating a diamond pattern on the canvas. But with my first attempt at making diamonds, I quickly found a problem. 
by iterating my grid from left to right and top to bottom, my diamonds aligned in that same grid pattern. They didn't fit nicely together. I could move them, but if I were to stagger my diamonds, I would not get the desired effect because I would have moved the original color out of its original position. I could try and make the diamonds bigger to fill the negative space, but even that didn't achieve the desired effect because as the code iterates the grid from left to right and top to bottom, it overdraws the ones to its immediate left and top. But like many other problems, Canvas's context has a method for that. Context rotate method rotates the drawing context inside the canvas element. It only takes one argument, an angle expressed in radians. So I speculated that if I rotated my grid at an angle of 45 degrees while I read the data and rotated my target canvas at an angle of negative 45 degrees while I drew the data, that I would get the diamonds I was looking for. But I still had a couple more problems to solve. <coughs> uh, rotate rotates the context from the top left corner, moving most of the image outside of the canvas. And as you might be able to tell, it also creates a larger image than the original canvas can support. Iterating this canvas would only bring back a portion of the original image. So I was going to need to resize the image and move it back to the center. For the sake of time, I'll have to breathe some of the detailed trigonometry required to calculate the dimensions of the bounding box, but it just requires some trigonometry. So dust off the math book. In simplest terms, the rotated box creates four triangles around it. The outer sides of these triangles define the sides of the bounding box. So using sine and cosine, we can calculate the lengths of the sides of those two triangles. And then by summing them, we can determine the size of the outer bounding box. The sum of the cosines will give you the width of the bounding box. The sum of the sines will give you the height. The distances that determine, oh, is that a hint? <clears throat> me, me, me. I'll leave music to Eduardo. The distance that defines uh, the offset required to return the image back to the center of the canvas depends on the angle of the rotation, but they can all be derived from this simple trigonometry. And with that, I now have the diamond pattern that I've been looking for. So from here, I can simply reintroduce my stacked dots. Does it still look like me? A little? At some point in my deconstruction, I realized that I'd create a highly flexible framework that gave me a lot of room to experiment. I had broken the problem down into the problems of scaling, color, and pattern, each of which I had ended up writing a, writing a small library for. All of those now combine into a big framework, and it turns out it's highly extensible, and everything I want to try takes only a few minutes to write a small portion. For example, I can easily create new styles and color spaces. Uh, I didn't think I'd have enough time today to, uh, to demo some of the other things, uh, so I actually left them out, but I've also written writers that import SVG to define the paths and output SVG for an infinitely scalable painting. I've also uh, added, wrapped my readers in request animation frame because Canvas draw image not only draws images and canvases, but videos. And I can, if anyone wants to come up to me at lunch, I will demonstrate uh, these portraits in real time using my webcam. Sorry for not bringing the wow moment. Extending upon this, I've also hacked together live WebRTC media streams to allow me to take portraits of friends. Here's actually an, an example <clears throat> where I converted 
SVG paths to the context Bezier curve method to simulate more organic brush strokes. And I look forward to the day when I can use the new Path2D class, which is currently only available in WebKit and Chromium Nightly, but improves performance by caching complex vector shapes. Also, I now have a tool with which I can document some important friends and figures from my scene. Maybe you'll recognize one or two of them. Yeah, that's Jed. Who are the, I don't know the other ones. No. And of course, lots of selfies. What was that? <laughs> so what did I learn from this project? Very similar to Eduardo. I'm an artist, and I got the chance to work with my art. I got the chance to have a lot of fun. I learned a lot about Canvas, its quirks, its performance. I learned about SVG. But more importantly, I learned what it was like to get back to the art world and just start freely creating again. Part of the reason this might seem so, uh, my presentation name might seem a little terse is because I was spending most of my time while I was working creating new filters because I got more excited about my code than the talk. No matter how hard I tried to stay focused on the talk, the code was always more fun. Creating a new version of the image, that's what I started this for. And that's why I'm here now. It brought me here to Brazil uh, to meet you. That's because right now, JavaScript is everywhere. It's in the browser, it's on the server, it's in your devices, it's in your robots. So if you know JavaScript, there's almost nothing preventing you from pursuing your other interests, like art and music, right there in your code. After all that work, was I able to recreate the perfect head? Probably not but I think it's close enough. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much. Wow, just wow.